Welcome to the Jurassic Park cast, the Jurassic Park podcast where guests chat with me, Bo Michael Crichton's 1990 novel Jurassic Park, and also not that too. My name's Ryan Rogers and I'm a big dumb Jurassic Park fan. Welcome to episode 20, When Dinosaurs Ruled the Earth, recorded here on the last day of school, June 29th, 2022. Thanks for joining me today. A continued thank you to Christoph Oaks of Snail, S-N-A-L-E. Check out his incredible album on Spotify and Bandcamp. Today's intro is from the song Sacrifice to the Inhuman Creature, and our outro is Late Bloomer. I have some corrections today. In the 1993 blockbuster Jurassic Park, a furious John Hammond screams twice in anguish and frustration, and I was almost positive it was Sir Richard Attenborough yelling his novel-adapted go-to cuss, BALLS! So I rewatched the film on June 11th, 2022, in part as an act of solidarity against Jurassic World Dominion because I had little faith they'd have made a movie that lived up to Spielberg's first adaptation and in some other way, I guess a tribute to the anniversary of the first film's release on that date in 1993. And I put on the captions this time. The first utterance is, DAMN! And the final one is, CRANT! But it was such Scottish enunciation that perhaps one such as myself might misremember it as him saying perhaps balls. But I was wrong. Sir Richard Attenborough doesn't say balls in the movie. But he sure does in the novel a lot. Uh, Also, a chef's hat isn't a paper hairnet. It's a masterful and traditional symbol of the culinary arts, originally designed with 100 pleats to represent the 100 different ways to cook an egg. And of course, I have gotten that all wrong. And dear Chicago, the Windy City, It did not receive its nickname from the weather, but rather from the windbags with inflated egos who cared about nothing but profits that comprised the city's corporate elite. I thought it was just windy there, for real. In Dinosaur News, first up, a paper came out earlier this year discussing where Iguanodon got its spiky thumb. The Zoological Journal of the Linnaean Society published reappraisal and new material of the holotype of Draconix provide insights on the tempo and modo of evolution of thumb-spiked dinosaurs in February 2022. Derived from the late Jurassic Lorena formation in Portugal, Draconix apparently had manual elements that hadn't been reported on, and so the authors of this paper took a peek at those. Ultimately, they used a variety of tools to take measurements of the fossils, and then used two analytical methods to confirm that, for a moderate-sized basal late Jurassic animal like Draconix, to evolve into a large late Cretaceous Styracosternin species of Iguantodontid, that its evolutionary rate must be high. I'm not sure by which standard an evolutionary rate is low, moderate, or high, but I'm not the author on this paper. Uh, the basal ornithischian analyzed was the Draconix, which is an ornithopod herbivore from the Kimmeridgian age of the late Jurassic, about 157 million years ago, known to be about 12 feet long, was uncovered in 1991. Its name means dragon claw. In particular, this paper describes its hand, which is believed to have been used to grasp the food it ate, which comes as a surprise to the paper's author because its closest relatives had very different hands, and in fact walked on them. Derived late Cretaceous Iguanodontians were way bigger, 33 feet long, known in the Baremian Age, about 125 million years ago, with much more derived features, including that famous stiff thumb spike and basically a hoof-like manis. They used a CT scanner and took linear measurements and then ran the holotype specimen through two data sets and analyzed it with maximum parsimony and Bayesian inference approaches to estimate evolutionary rates among Iguanodontia. And so, through their analysis, they believe that in 32 million years, the little Draconics-like animals evolved their dainty hands to be far more robust and spiky, and doing so required a, quote, high rate of evolution. Both their analytical approaches suggest that Iguanodontians had a high evolutionary rate, or that they derived into specialists from the ornithopodan ancestor in the late Jurassic, like the Draconics, very quickly to become the giant quadrupedal thumb-spined styracosternans of the late Cretaceous. And frankly, the Iguanodontans didn't stop there, further evolving quickly into even wider variety of hadrosaurs later in the late Cretaceous, so good for them. The next article comes from the Journal of South American Earth Sciences called, quote, Insights into Paleoecology of the Bajo Barriel Formation, Patagonia, Argentina, published in June 2022. We're going to be talking about Mesozoic ecosystems and wildlife preserves later in this episode, and so perhaps hearing about an actual dinosaur landscape would be informative. This article presents the, quote, first integrate paleoecological study, which includes both previous and new sedimentological paleoclimate fauna and flora analyses in the Bajo Barriel Formation, 
which is a late Cretaceous formation in Patagonia, Argentina. In this formation, the paleo environment is characterized by, quote, low sinuosity, single channelized fluvial systems with well developed proximal floodplains, which I think is a very specific type of river that is fairly straight and has predictable recurring floodplains. In this environment, the weather was warm and humid with, quote, marked seasonality, says the paper. It was dominated by dinosaurs, including sauropods like titanosaurs and robachosaurids, and theropods like abelosaurids and megaraptorids. But other vertebrates such as pterosaurs, crocodiliforms, turtles, and fishes were also part of the ecosystem. They also performed an isotope analysis of the dinosaur and crocodile teeth, which revealed that different sources of water were utilized by theropod and sauropod dinosaurs, and also provided some information on the diet of the animals. The Rabachosaurids, which are like a smaller form of Diplodocus with distinct teeth and neural vertebrae, likely fed at the ground level, where ferns were the main non-arboreal component, says the paper. Angiosperms, which are flowering plants, like eudicots and monocots, which are the bulbing plants and grains, would have been present as well. Mid-height feeding is suspected of the Titanosaurid sauropods, who would have fed off gymnosperms like cycads and ginkgos, uh, which are like coniferous trees and to a lesser degree other conifers and things like that. Uh, the top predator would have been the abelosaurids because they're the most abundant theropods in the fossil record here. And broadly speaking, the study augments science's knowledge of Cretaceous terrestrial ecosystems of South Central Patagonia and contributes for further comparisons with other chronologically equivalent localities, principally from the Southern Hemisphere. I'm surprised there wasn't a paleoentomologist on the paper because there are loads of bugs and bees and wasps and termites and beetles from the fossil record. And surely there must be some known from this age and formation. But with the corrections and dinosaur news out of the way, please let me introduce you to two special guests this episode. Joining me today, I have two guests, and in no particular order, the first is David Moscato, who is a paleontologist and science communicator who's taught at every age level from elementary to university classrooms, and presently is a science communicator at the East Tennessee State University's Gray Fossil Site, a freelance science writer for publications like PLOS One, and surely influential in many more things than that, too. And our second is Will Harris, who is a paleontologist and science communicator who's presently a fluor educator at Hands-On Discovery Center in Johnson City, Tennessee who's also been a guest engagement facilitator at the Florida Aquarium and an education and outreach coordinator at the Museum of Science and Industry in St. Petersburg, Florida, among many other things, too. And together they assembled to form the awesome expression of paleontology and science communication, the Common Descent Podcast. So thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, have you guys ever been competitive cyclists? No, 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 me neither. I've barely been a cyclist. <laughs> so me neither. Which that's made, something we all have in common. Yeah, it made our, our meeting on a post facto podium declaring us first, second, and third place finishers at the all of the Tour de France races between 1999 and 2005. All the more surprising. So congratulations to us for being the last competitor standing after the urine tests came back. <laughs> I have no memory of the 24 hours leading up to that moment. <laughs> <laughs> the urine tests are very fatiguing, I know, yeah. <laughs> So you guys run an extraordinary podcast called the Common Descent Podcast. My favorite episodes are like the Silver Screen ones are very good. You had an excellent one on the Hell Creek Formation, uh, the terrific one of Vultures on Horse Evolution, the La Brea Tar Pits, Elephants and Sauropods and Ceratopsians and Ankylosaurs and the Bone Wars and Spina and like everything. And like I could keep going and going. <laughs> uh, the Extinction ones are terrific. There's way more than I could ever list. But uh, what have been some of your favorite episodes that you've worked on? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, it, it definitely goes with, with our moods. Like, I know for me, <laughs> I'll be more excited for one kind of topic one week, and then the next week I'll be like, no, nah, I, like, I really want to do a, a group of animals, or I'm definitely not in the mood to do this kind of topic. But mm -hmm. uh, I often lean toward when we get to discuss a more conceptual science concept. Those tend to be some of my, my favorites. Okay. Yeah, our main series episodes, we bounce around all sorts of different paleontology themed topics. Uh, I've always loved the extinction episodes, mm -hmm. and those mm -hmm. have been a fan favorite, which is really nice. And then, yeah, it's always nice to, to focus in on a particular group of living or extinct organisms. But then, of course, we do our side projects. Yep. Silver Screen Science, always super fun, because mm -hmm. what that means is we just we watch a movie and then talk about science, <laughs> which is fantastic. Which are two of our favorite things to do anyway. Yes, we were doing that before we sat before a microphone. Yes, we just turned that microphone on and people have been listening to it. I think that's how they filmed uh, Clerks, yeah. Right? <laughs> uh, one of my favorite of our side projects is we do a Halloween special called Spookulative Evolution where we take a 
famous or a classic or historical monster and say, okay, what could re- you know, semi-realistically evolve to be something similar to, you know, a Hydra or a zombie or a vampire. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's I, a lot of fun for us, and it gets us a lot of fan art. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, thinking of the uh, evolutionary pressures that would um, lead somebody to to do, yeah, that'd be weird. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. So have you guys got, I mean, you mentioned an opportunity to perhaps talk about some of the projects you have coming up or anything like that that you have going on that people might be interested in hearing more about? Yeah, our podcast, so we release main episodes uh, fortnightly, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. one every two weeks. These days, this summer, we are engaged in a new expansive project uh, celebrating what we have determined to be Croc Month Mm -hmm. in June and Snake Month in July. And this follows up on a long-running shtick of ours in our podcast, uh, talking about and debating the merits of crocs and snakes. And this year, we kicked off the year celebrating our five-year anniversary of the podcast. Mm. So we decided that we would take our crocs and snakes shtick to the next level. Yeah. (laughs) So in June, we've got all sorts of croc stuff going on on social media, on Discord, on our Patreon. And then July, we'll do the same thing for snakes. Mm -hmm. The probably biggest and coolest of which are going to be a pair of special bonus episodes where we're going to have special guests on to talk about croc and snake conservation okay in celebration of world croc day and world snake day and we've launched a new tier on our patreon where subscribers can not only get the usual patreon goodies Mm -hmm. but bonus patreon goodies and contribute to charitable donations towards conservation efforts excellent excellent yeah. And of course, it, it's June, so we will also be shortly after recording mm-hmm. this, releasing an episode of Silver Screen Science, where we yep. talk about the science of movies. This one regarding Jurassic World Dominion, which just came out. Uh, very good. So I have a kind of a relationship with Tennessee, also, although a very fleeting one. And you guys are presently both like in a room in Tennessee, is that right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. East Tennessee. So are you familiar with something? And I had to look it up because it's just this thing we wound up at one time. The Dinosaur Walk Museum in Pigeon Forge. I, I feel like I've heard that name, but I, I've never I, been. I feel like we know people who know that place. Yes. Okay. That, like, if you said that to some friends of ours, they'd say yes. Okay. Yes. So, uh, I haven't spent much time at Pigeon Forge. Mm-mm. So I, I we just were kind of, we took a, uh, so like most dinosaur animatronics and models, especially on touring exhibit, they're kind of stilted and rigid and kind of unconvincing and, and they look like a doll that mm-hmm. kind of decorated. But this place was just entirely in a different stratosphere. It was amazing. And um, I thought maybe you'd have heard of it. We, we we took some trip into like the Smoky Mountains once upon a time. There was this long, I don't know, mu- dinosaur museum we just bumped into. And it was like the greatest animatronic and life-size sculpture exhibit that I'd ever seen. And the story was that it was like financed by someone who used to do like war plane museums or something like that. And uh, I guess he had a kid or a grandkid that liked Jurassic Park quite a bit. And so he commissioned this huge exhibit. I didn't know if that was something you guys had seen or heard of, but it was amazing. That's cool. very cool. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've gone to a couple of those those kind of uh, 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 we just have dinosaur displays up. You know, we're not really a museum. Mm-hmm. Right? There's not like a place for research or yeah. collection. It's just here's some cool stuff that you can look at. Yeah. Here's some impressive structures. And I've even been to ones where they are still educational uh, mm-hmm. and everything. But yeah, I've, I've been to a, a couple of those, but not not nearly as often recently. <laughs> And every now and then I'm just tempted to just be like, just to see, just to see what is going on, just to see what they have and see if I, I stumble upon one like that, where it's like, actually, this is, you know, decent. This one's, this one's doing a good job. Interesting. Uh, so. <laughs> well, yeah. it was, it was, I remember being really cool. It was one of those is kind of back. I mean, 2003 is just when you had like your first generation digital cameras and like your, the, the cards and your you don't have copies of those pictures anymore. So like, it's all lost to my right. memory, but uh, I wish I, uh, I wish I could remember that still. And I don't know if it's still around, but anyhow, I, I was hoping you guys had seen or heard of it. So we are chatting today. This will come out later, but uh, we're chatting on June 13th, which is an anniversary of mine. Uh, you guys said you had your fifth anniversary of the podcast coming up June 13th in 1993, of course, was the day I got to see Jurassic Park for the first time. 
and uh, so that's kind oh, yeah. of where we're sitting. Nice. Now I had to wait a few days for my dad to take me to the theater, and uh, we didn't see it opening night, but we got to check it out, and so that uh, that was pretty neat. And then of course we're connecting uh, in an equally culturally momentous weekend for dinosaurs and popular culture because this is the weekend after Jurassic World Dominion has been unleashed on the world. <laughs> I haven't seen it, but uh, <laughs> you know, without have you guys got a, had a chance to watch it already? Dominion, Dominion? yes, yeah, yeah we saw it yesterday okay well without scooping your own show because that wouldn't be fair but you know what uh initial reaction before you jump into it what, what did you get think of it uh <laughs> just overall <laughs> as a movie going experience uh we did not enjoy it no we were not fans <laughs> okay. now it, it's probably important for context we we didn't like the last jurassic world we mm-hmm, didn't like mm-hmm. fallen kingdom yeah no so we we were not expecting to like this one yeah right uh but so it, did it was not a surprise. Disappoint our disappointment, but we did see it as part of our professional responsibility, <laughs> so that we could then make a podcast episode about it. Uh, yes. Now, the, our podcast episode, our main podcast episode, uh, fortunately, is not about our personal opinions of the movie or our thoughts about like the cinematic quality of it. We mm-hmm. talk about science and yeah. how science and yeah. scientists are represented in movies. Now that being it is very academic yes sort of analysis which allows us to kind of put aside we, we don't get on the podcast and say we hated it we talk about science stuff yeah yeah but that being said that's not going to be any friendlier to the film no <laughs> this is also not very well represented in this movie nope i can appreciate uh, so that. I, we will have an interesting discussion it's going to be fascinating i'm sure well i know in your silver screen episodes in advance of this uh, with your other jurassic park reviews that you you'd coined a term or at least employed a term the monsterification of the animals and uh and i don't think there's a better way to explain it i um to me with a global like i haven't seen it but to me in a true jurassic world uh portrayal on film where where you'd have monsterified dinosaurs that are actually in the wild i can only envision if you ever watch um like youtube videos of people playing massive multiplayer online video games where everybody's just forget the consequences going full bore ahead just going insane <laughs> that you a world with yeah. jurassic world monsterified dinosaurs would just be complete chaos of people running into each other from all different like jets and tanks flying through the air just to be insane because and there'd be no way to script it it would be literally just create chaos it would be insane but yeah but I, it, it makes me think of like the uh, skyrim style game to where it's just Every animal in this is either something that you're supposed to kill or that is trying to kill you. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's just, you know, oh, you made eye contact with that animal across the land. It's now charging to murder you. <laughs> and it's, that, it's that the way that the, the uh, animals have been being presented is that's how they feel to me. It's just that video game monster, that video game bear. <laughs> well, we, we looked at each other, so now we must do it with that. <laughs> It's aware of your presence in the vicinity, so... <laughs> yeah, nothing can be done. So, I remember after Fallen Kingdom came out that there was uh, this... I don't know if every post on the internet is called a meme anymore, but it was something like that. And it was something along the lines of Jurassic Park 3 is starting to look pretty good after after each new installment of Jurassic Park. I think as new films come out, Jurassic Park 3 is being seen a little bit differently. The common perception appreciates, I guess, what it was more than... When it first came out... It basically killed the franchise. Nobody liked it. It was roasted in 2001. Yes. Now people are looking back on it going, you know what? It's not so bad considering uh, the new ones. Um, <laughs> and that, I mean, it's not like it's remained unchanged too. Like that its perception has improved and it's remaining a static construct. Like it's not like George Lucas went back and inserted new scenes to uh, add mm-hmm. CGI or something like that. Like it's, it's still the same, but for some reason these new films... <laughs> are improving the perspective of this of this yeah. one that was roasted for being the worst thing. How do you feel about that? What does that, I guess, say I, about the, the later installments? It it has kind of gotten a similar treatment that the the Star Wars prequels have gotten recently, where there's the fan base for the prequels, which were also heavily heavily criticized, has been growing and getting more confident to be like no. No, we like these films, and we don't <laughs> care that you don't like them. Uh, I've been seeing lots more of that energy for Jurassic Park 3 as well. I think that part of that is, uh, probably it's there's part of it is nostalgia. Yes. Is that we're looking back, and, and nowadays, 
uh, a lot of the people enjoying the franchise, the Jurassic World franchise, grew up with Jurassic Park 3. Mm -hmm. A lot of people got started with Jurassic Park 3. Okay. There's this nostalgia to it. But I, I, I suspect that there's also a part of it that for people who don't like the newer movies, yeah. that it serves as a comparison to, to look back and go, well... At least I mean, it's not at least kingdom. it didn't do this. Yeah, yeah. at least it's yeah. not falling kingdom. Yeah, <laughs> and so I, I think that it, even if, uh, like for example, I would not. I still don't think Jurassic Park three is no. good. I don't really like it. It's it's <laughs> yeah. I still have um, I still have all the criticisms I've always had for it. But okay. I think that if you put it side by side with some of the newer movies, there are certainly positives to compare. Yes. So yeah, yeah. I, I think that th those factors can come together to mm -hmm. sort of retroactively uh, improve the perception of a movie. Well, and I've also noticed that uh, for a lot of people, there are iconic aspects to Jurassic Park 3 that have maintained, at least for those people, like I've seen lots of posts of people specifically loving the design of the raptors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in three. Those. Yeah, and that that's like, for them, those are the, I, the, the peak raptor. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the first time I saw that, I was like, huh, okay. I, I don't even disagree with that. No, they look cool. Yeah. That's I fine. Just, I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah. And so, like, uh, I, I wonder if it's how much of it is just that there are enough unique things about it that it has. Well, it's kind of like, you know, even if I have criticisms of the Star Wars prequels, like the the rolling, the roll-up droidicas, like the... <laughs> force field ball droids those are cool i don't care who you are those are awesome yeah. mm -hmm. and i think that there may also be something to be said that it is a lot of fun to to criticize a movie when it's new yeah but uh loving a movie lasts longer yeah so the people who like jurassic park 3 uh, which okay. there are many okay i feel like those are the voices that probably withstand the test of time whereas the rest of us are just like nah, i didn't like it yeah and well, then i don't want to talk about jurassic park too. right it is ultimately more fun to enjoy a film than <laughs> to not enjoy a film exactly <laughs> i suppose you're absolutely right nobody's chiming in 20 years later no 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 it's still a bad movie all the time <laughs> <laughs> here's my hot take don't right, ever forget exactly. well to me and, and this is kind of just my perspective and maybe it's because i'm not viewing this as like the preteen from that from that from that first film and, and so you, you grow up and you know more about storytelling and you know more about movie making. And to me, anytime mm -hmm. like a dinosaur enters stage right, mugs for the camera, pauses to roar, and then continues pursuing, like that that whole, I don't know, mock-up of, of making them have their, their moment in the spotlight before they continue on, like, hey, I'm here, just, it bugs me. It feels like a real failure because it's like almost like some wrestler running into the ring and then like he does a bit of you know showing off and then they get into wrestling afterwards it just feels like storytelling not done well and and that takes me out of it because it's i don't know the dinosaurs could look as amazing as possible but if they're acting like yogi bear it doesn't matter yes <laughs> they just kind of acting yes. odd just having them i guess show up and, and scream it's such a tired trope. You see Anakin Skywalker do it when Padme is revealed to have died. He goes, no! And you watch Dana Scully yeah. do it. And you just every time something walks on screen, it has this overused tropey moment. It, it, that takes me out of, the, out of enjoying the moments, that's for sure. I think that this, this is something that we've mm -hmm. uh, come to realize. And I think it's an important thing to be aware of is that different people go to movies for different things. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think... It feels like a lot of the people who really enjoy uh, the Jurassic Park movies, especially the more recent, the, the Jurassic World movies, mm -hmm. and a lot of the people who are making the Jurassic World movies, enjoy them the same way they enjoy a monster movie, yes. or mm -hmm. Godzilla, or something, where for, for a lot of people, the dinosaurs, that's what they're there for. They're there to be big and larger than life and dangerous and a bit cartoony. Well, I was going to say, a character. A character. Like, Godzilla is a character he's supposed to have a very you know uh, uh if not like you know just down to earth but you should be able to relate to his motivations right and everything and he drives the plot yeah with and, his, his desires exactly mm -hmm. and anything you put in a movie is going to have a little bit of that like there's going to be a purpose <laughs> to it it's it's going to have story structure around it so like the T-Rex has a personality in the first film sure. mm -hmm. but it doesn't have a human personality <laughs> Like it doesn't right. feel like a person. It feels like a dog at best. Yes, exactly. And so it's that 
over characterizing uh, that you know that personification mm -hmm. you know, that posing for the camera that you were saying mm -hmm. uh when when blue does her avengers poses yes <laughs> exactly she does the hero landings yes uh that's one of those where for us that's a negative but for lots of other people that is a positive mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is what they're, here for. they're like yes yes do more cool things fist bump you know fist bump chris pratt like, yes <laughs> i want to see the dinosaurs nod approvingly to each other exactly <laughs> knowingly <laughs> silent understanding passes between them yes okay and think... so yeah it's it's weird to how it can be different for different people yeah for sure and the world takes all different types man i won't take that away from the world and you make a good point about characterizing animals. I know in Jurassic World, they did a very good job building up a character for the Indominus Rex. Whether you like the Indominus Rex or not, they said, here's why this guy is a psychopath, because he got made this way. Yes. And uh, I don't know, are all the dinosaurs still girls after all these years? Do they even do they bother with that I anymore? I don't know if they've mentioned that. Yeah, they haven't recently. said it outright. Because Blue is, is female, mm -hmm. and they, they repeatedly refer to Blue as female. Yeah. I don't remember if they call Indominus. I feel like in, in, in my brain, Indominus is female, but I don't remember if they actually say that in the movie. Yeah, the, the, it's my assumption, but and yeah. that may just be because we're you know old school fans that right, we're stuck on the original dress. Oh, the dinosaurs yeah, I just assume yeah. that the default is they're all female okay. uh, until you tell me otherwise. I mean, there's definitely male dinosaurs as we get into the films because there's the mating pair of t-rexes yes. and stuff like that and there, are, mm. there are babies being like they're yeah. breeding so obviously statistically a yeah. good chunk of those are going to be male but it's like until you tell me otherwise i just assume but yeah i don't actually i can't remember <laughs> them mentioning it in any of the newer films nope. if they're still using that practice all right so huh well forget about the films let's talk about crocodiles and snakes and dinosaurs so will forgive me you're the croc guy yes all right, right on. So yes, I am. You're celebrating Croc Month on the podcast. By the time this comes out, all the crocodile awesomeness will probably be available on your on your stream for for downloading right away. I looked into the book to see what the Jurassic Park, the novel, tell us about crocodiles. Uh, and maybe we can start with this. Um, uh, there's one scene where they talk about how uh, they are known to swallow gizzard stones, and they sl swim well. We know yeah. they swim well. Uh, gizzard stones. Do all species do this? Yeah, basically. Uh... Crocodilians, which is the overall group of crocodiles, alligators, caimans, gharial, will swallow gastrolites, okay. stomach stones. And it's partially uh, to help grind. They do have a muscular section to their stomach. Mm -hmm. It's like a bird gizzard. And since they cannot chew, they just swallow chunks of food. It's mm -hmm. not that that's going to help process their food, mm -hmm. uh, but also likely to help weigh them and balance their weight in the water. Mm -hmm. There's still some questions as to exactly which roles the stones play more than others, but it is a practice that they all do. Uh, this is why lots of zoos and places with crocodilians make a point to say, don't throw anything in here because mm -hmm. they will swallow it and like they, they will actively swallow odds and ends okay. because they're swallowing rocks. So they can't really tell the difference between right. a rock okay. and a quarter that you throw in. Yeah. So yeah, they, they actively seek out those kinds of objects to, to swallow. And you'll, uh, you can find them uh, rounded and reduced in size from the friction and the acid in their stomach as eventually they'll just pass it. Okay, and, and I know crocodiles are, are, are celebrated as being one of the, the last surviving, I guess, common ancestors for dinosaurs. And be, I mean, I get to see birds out my window. I don't get to see crocodiles out my window. So <laughs> I used to. I, I lived in Florida for a bit, and I used to just get to glance out. It was great. So I guess what could what could if I were observing crocodiles or alligators, what would they be doing that I could imagine? Because I like to imagine when I see a bird that I like to imagine as a dinosaur, doing dinosaur things. If I were looking at a crocodile or an alligator, what would it be doing there? I could say, ah, yes, I could picture a dinosaur doing that. Yeah. Also, uh, interesting. Absolutely. And, cool. There's yeah, a, and, and for the sort of phylogeny of all this. Birds and crocodilians are both in the group that we call archosaurs, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. also includes all the extinct dinosaurs. So, yeah, they're all cousins. Yes. And a lot of times in research today, when we're studying or trying to think of what dinosaur behavior would be, they will look at birds and crocs. Mm -hmm. Because if, it is, if there's a feature shared between both birds and crocs, it's likely that it was an archosaur feature, that it was shared by most 
in this group. Okay. And therefore very likely for dinosaurs. You know, so the fact that both birds and crocs are noisy. The alligators have that bellow that they do during yeah. mating season and they hiss and they will at, uh, vocalize at one another. Both of them have parental care. Uh, you know, that's something that is notable in basically all species of crocodilian that they guard their nest and care for their young, uh, guard the young. Uh, some more than others. Some uh, will even guard other uh, mother's babies. Okay. Gharials will often guard multiple clutches of young. And so child care is another one of those things. And then the fact that they have like a complicated heart uh, and breathing system. So those kinds of social and, you know, more complex uh, behaviors like uh, that's, that are shared between the two groups as likely similar things that we would see in dinosaurs. Uh, if, you, if you see a gator do something that also a bird would do, yep. you are, uh, it is a reasonable hypothesis to think that T-Rex and Triceratops may have done that thing. Okay. Yes, that, and that's that cool. Is, as possible. Uh, they'll also be looked at for motion and for movement. Okay. Uh, but crocodilians do have a very distinct, like, leg and hip structure compared to dinosaurs. So that's not a one, like, dinosaurs did not walk around like an alligator <laughs> walks around. Right. But we will look at them for locomotion stuff since they're the only big archosaurs left, you know, so we'll sometimes use them to figure out like, all right, well, how, how does a bird and a croc move? Mm -hmm. What can we learn from that? Birds take bites, but they don't chew. And a lot of dinosaurs clearly take bites, but they didn't, maybe they didn't chew. They probably didn't chew. A lot of dinosaurs did. Um, crocodiles seem to, and alligators seem to take bites, but it doesn't look like they chew their food. They just kind of, they just heave it back. But some dinosaurs grew molars, and they, they became very good at chewing, and I think they're, they're famously good at that. Is there anything in the fossil record that shows crocodiles bothering to get molars or to grind their food up before they eat it? Absolutely. Yeah? Cool. Uh, there okay. Are, there, yes. There, so our modern <laughs> Croc species... Ancient crocs are super diverse and yes. fascinating. Okay. Our modern species all basically look very similar body shape. They all have a long snout with pointy teeth. Uh, but we do get some crocs today with like flatter, you know, rounder teeth in the back, specifically for cracking open shells and stuff. Okay. And in the fossil record, there are uh, crocodilla forms, crocodilla morphs mm -hmm. that are cousins to today's crocs, but different groups within the overall croc lineage that uh, were likely herbivorous. And a few of them have not only roughly flattened teeth, you know, kind of molar-ish, molar mm -hmm. form, but also canine-shaped teeth up front with smaller teeth in front of that and then flatter teeth behind that, a very mammal-like, like very similar to really? our tooth arrangement of I have things to grab and nip up front and things to crush in the back. That's amazing. Now, whether they were, like, chewing the cud like a cow and, like, you're sitting there and grinding it down to a paste. Mm -hmm. yeah, they might not have been that good at chewing, but they were probably better at smashing and processing it more before they swallowed it. Okay. Uh, so yeah, there are some crocs that have something very close to a molar. Okay. That's super cool. Well, good to hear. It's awesome. I love those crocs. Because I know, yeah, through time, every time, every once in a while, there'd be like a new burst of crocodile information where they tell you, oh, this one looked like a duck, and this one looked like a chihuahua, and this one looked like... And you're just like, oh my God, look at all these little things. And they've been around for so long, yep. but why wouldn't they look a little different? In the book, they, the crocodiles kind of make two other appearances in some respects. One, I think Grant is uh, describing the, the the raptor nest that they're hoping to get to, and Gennaro is like, what do you mean they're going to find this nest? And then, uh, like, how do you know about their, their nurturing habits and stuff like that? And he, Grant makes a, a description of how the bull American alligator will blow bubbles on the female's cheeks for months to, quote, bring her to receptivity. How does that hold up in terms of, like, sometimes Crichton science isn't good, and sometimes it's fine. <laughs> How does that hold up? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, uh, they absolutely do have complex mating behavior. Nice. Uh, blowing bubbles is specifically, uh, that one is a croc behavior. They will, the male will blow bubbles. Uh, uh, I think for a lot of crocodiles, it's like down the length of the female's body. Mm -hmm. They'll also do things like press the female under the water. And that's a mating behavior. Uh, the bellows 
is a mating display. So they have a lot of complex mating uh, uh, courtship behaviors. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. some will even like stick with that mate basically, you know, for the rest of their life. They may not be monogamous with that mate. Mm -hmm. you know, they may have other mates, but that male and that female will likely stay in each other's territory for the rest of their life uh, in certain species. It's so weird to hear about mating behaviors in animals every now and then that are actually kind of sweet. Yeah. Because <laughs> so, it's so often when when you think about mating behaviors, it's like, yeah, they're, they're betting heads to yep. fight over females or they, this one bites the neck of the female to hold on while they're trying to stay together or whatever. <laughs> but then every now and then there's one like, yeah, the male crocodile will blow gently blow bubbles along the length of the mm -hmm. female's body and it's like that's super cute yeah <laughs> yep i i want someone to blow bubbles <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. that sounds great a little jacuzzi that's fun that's fun and uh exactly. yes and when you talk about comparing um, common traits among birds and crocodiles, and then supposing that dinosaurs likely did that too. We know that birds are so complicated and interesting in the sounds they make and their courtship routines. I can only imagine what a dinosaurian uh, world where maybe it's a springtime when they're when, when they're open, what it would sound like, and and all the fascinating. I mean, the courtship dances, who knows? But all the different things. That yes. The vocalization and all the weird behavior would really be tied up in that that mating process because birds and it seems crocs. We can draw that. If that's true, if that's a good hypothesis to work with. That would be a fascinating uh, time to visit the Mesozoic. Oh, yeah. I, I can only imagine that the world and the age of dinosaurs was full of noises and flashy displays and silly dances. Like, there, there must have been dinosaurs doing all of this. Mm -hmm. These complex mating, showy, flashy, bird-like and croc-like mating behaviors. And, and it's probably some of the just the weirdest noises because like you know <laughs> we think about like bird song it's like yeah it's a, a chirp or a whistle but like a bunch of birds and crocs do that internal resonating where i'm making a noise in my chest and i'm not opening my mouth and it's just this ooh, like yeah. deep weird boomy thing and dinosaurs they were so such weird shapes they had to just be making <laughs> the most bizarre sounds well and they did this a little in the recent documentary series, mm -hmm. Prehistoric mm -hmm. Planet, which includes a lot of this kind of sort of hypothetical depictions of dinosaurs, where it's like, here's some stuff that uh, is based on things animals do today uh, that could pop, could you know, potentially be things we see in ancient dinosaurs. And there is the probably now famous scene with Carnotaurus, yes. where they have it do a little bit of both. They have it do a very croc-like bellow that mm -hmm. sort of rumble to call a mate and then it does a straight up birds of paradise style <laughs> dance yep and it's fantastic yes yeah. it's we don't have direct it. evidence of those <laughs> behaviors specifically but something like that absolutely uh, probably existed with What's dinosaurs that? at this point according to our understanding of everything it would be weird if dinosaurs weren't doing that stuff mm -hmm. i'd be shocked we have to actually figure out why they aren't yes there would have to be something odd about them that <laughs> yes. would make them not do those things great point all right we did crocs uh, i don't have to be sherlock holmes to say therefore david you must be the snake specialist uh snakes are in jurassic park a little bit but not a lot there were there are a bit few, fewer and farther between we've got uh one in the clever girl moment in the film where yes. the raptor watches that snake slither along a branch while Muldoon is being eviscerated. And eviscerated mm -hmm. is terrific because it means that your viscera is being removed. That's just terrible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> to, what's it mean, I guess, in your opinion, that Spielberg chose, ah, let's just, instead of this raptor joining in on the on the kill, why would he stop and watch this snake? What do you think that has to do with anything about Jurassic Park? You know, I have I have often wondered this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's it because it is a very specific image of the snake kind of crawling along the the log, and I've wondered: is this supposed to be symbolic? Mm -hmm. Is it supposed to be a message of like this is an age of reptiles again? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is the is the snake supposed to uh, bring to mind the sort of stereotypical idea of a cold, unblinking? Yeah creature yep. and is that supposed to be how we're, it's leading us to think that about the, the velociraptor or was it just that they wanted to put something in the picture so yeah here's a snake to go there 
I don't know. I, I have also wondered, I was like, why is that the one place you put a snake in your movie? There yeah, is... I always, I, I always assumed that the, the raptor was... The, like, the reason that they focus on it holding still is because it, it was waiting for the main female to, like, mm-hmm. finish feeding and everything. Because okay. they make the point that there's the dominant female that right. killed almost all the others and now is in charge of them. Yes, and so, mm-hmm. like, I assume... Yeah, I, to me, this says you are not that female, or else you would have kicked the other raptor off of <laughs> right. Muldoon. <laughs> uh, so, I, yeah, I, I, it's. I always remember liking it as a kid because a snake showed up. At the beginning of the book, there's an epigraph um, by Linnaeus, and he specifically says that. And when, you, when we talked about maybe we're talking about how this weird, terrible reptilian world we're living in and the dinosaurs have come back, and this is kind of the world we're in. The, the, the epigraph at the beginning is all about how reptiles are abhorrent because of all the horrible things that reptiles are. And so it, you really could be onto something there about maybe that's Spielberg's link with that. We're in a strange world here where that doesn't belong to us. It belongs to the, to the dinosaur, to the reptile, which is really cool. The other thing is maybe that he was uh, standing still so that the other raptor is that the snake didn't even know we're there. We're coming flying it from the side <laughs> and eat the snake too. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that was or maybe kinda... the other two snakes. Yes, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> coming from the sides. You make uh, it... <laughs> that was kind of one of my thoughts was like, maybe it was supposed to be representing that the raptor was being so uh, uh, still. Mm-hmm. Right. That Even it, the had, snake isn't reacting. Yeah, that it just became part of the, the backdrop to the snake. Okay, that's right. And that's, that's right. how focused the raptor is being. Right. Even the snake didn't know it was there. That's really cool. And I, I had a friend that was like, that was the worst scene in the movie, the clever girl part. Like, oh, how dumb was that? But if you if you break it down, the, the story arc between Muldoon and the big one, the clever girl, yeah. it, it starts in the first scene where he's like, shoot up. That's her. And then when he goes up to the raptor pen and they're all meeting him, he's like, listen, we put this new one in here. It killed everybody. It's bad news. It's got people attacking the fence. And so his nemesis is uh, the big one. And the big one gets him yes. in the end and at the end he's like oh you win this one i guess <laughs> but just uh and he's the great white hunter he's supposed to be the epitome of um of uh the survivalist mm-hmm. and in any case the yeah. i mean it's so subtextual it's so understated but it's incredible it's like one of the better character journeys that anybody gets this fun mouse uh cat and mouse game between the two of them which is really cool yeah i i love that scene in the film and we've talked about this both in like silver screen and, and, and when it's come up in other topics, because so often the peakment of showing how smart these Raptors are is when they open the door, Mm -hmm. Uh, which is, uh, you know, that's a great (laughs) way to show that these are problem solving animals. But a lot of people look at that and be like, well, they're so smart. They can open doors. It's like, well, I can teach a dog to open a door. (laughs) Cats can figure it out. Yeah. Horses can do it. I've had a cat that would just reach under the door and wrench it open Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's like, that's not that, you know, that's not that unusual, Mm -hmm. but that hunting scene where one acted as a decoy Mm -hmm. for Muldoon to be, uh, let his guard down in the wrong direction so that they could flank him. That's such a great, subtle, and, uh, not only a cool way to show their intelligence, but also to best a human mm-hmm, mm-hmm. at the task, at, at his own game. Yes, we are uh, both hunting. hunting each other, and we outfought you because you assumed yeah. you were too an- animalistic for and you it, to watch your back. That's great. I love the that display of their intelligence. And then subsequent watchings, it's foreshadowed entirely by Grant in that one moment where mm-hmm. he says, this is exactly how it's going to happen. And uh, he foreshadows yes. how he's going to escape from the Tyrannosaur, too, where he's talking about the visual acuity of a T-Rex. Whether that, you know, holds up to, <laughs> to scrutiny doesn't matter. It's how it worked in the film. And uh, that scene where he t- describes both dinosaurs uh, at the same time shows that, I guess, had he been there to help Muldoon, maybe he would have uh, maybe he would have survived. But that's neither here nor there. So more <laughs> snakes we have. Uh, the Tyrannosaurus tongue is described as snake-like uh, in two different ways. It reads that his tongue is like a coiling, constricting snake that literally wraps around one of the kid's heads, but also that it has uh, that forked yeah. prong. And so he's got this uh, double-pointed tip on its tongue. Is that common among all snakes? Uh, yes. So the, the forked tongue is a snake feature. Mm-hmm. And you also see it in a lot of other lizards. Okay. So that's that's something you see in, for example, in monitor lizards, uh, heloderma, the yes. beaded lizards have that. I've seen it reconstructed 
potentially <laughs> for mosasaurs, yeah. the big swimming lizards of okay. the Mesozoic. And the forked tongue, generally, so in snakes, the benefit of the forked tongue is that the tongue in snakes is a sensing organ to sense things external to the body. Okay. So the tongue comes out of the mouth, and it sweeps through the air, and it picks up essentially scent molecules, mm -hmm. scent and taste molecules. And having a forked tongue gives them the same benefit that we get from having an ear on either side of our head or okay. two nostrils is it lets you detect direction, right? If I hear a sound, I not only pick up the sound, but I know what direction the sound came from hmm. because of which ear is picking it up more strongly. A snake's forked tongue does the same thing. A snake can tell, right, which direction did this mouse go? The scent is stronger to my left, so I, I can go to the left to try to follow this mouse. Okay, so by your comment, I would deduce that uh, the mosasaur, the snake, and the monitor lizard may have a common ancestor. Would that be the theory? Uh, yes, so snakes snakes are lizards. Yeah. They are a per particularly different and interesting branch of the lizard family yes. tree, <laughs> in the same way that birds are a branch of the dinosaur family tree. Uh, and snakes' closest relatives among lizards are probably monitor lizards, uh, beaded lizards. Mosasaurs fall within that general group as well. Okay. So as opposed to, like, chameleons and... Uh, geckos and, and lizards like that who do not have similar tongues or mm -hmm. indeed other features that are similar. So if a tyrannosaur has the forked tongue, I think the velociraptors have a forked tongue, but it would deduce that all the dinosaurs in Crichton's world should also have these forked tongues, that it would be unusual that some of them would have it, but others would not, that it would be, do you, would that be reasonable? Or do you think uh, it would be specifically theropods or? Uh, it's, it's interesting. So uh, there are lizards that don't mm -hmm. and lizards that do uh so there could potentially be dinosaurs that have a thing and dinosaurs that don't it's odd to imagine dinosaurs with a forked tongue yeah because they wouldn't have been using a tongue for sensing in that way right that's not something that crocs have it's not something yeah. that birds have mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. their so. tongues are much more limited and much more restricted usually and they're using, you know, using to move around food in the mouth, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Except for things very specialists, so like uh, woodpeckers. Is that what I'm yeah, thinking of? Yeah, woodpeckers have that harpoon that, tongue. Yeah, the harpoon <laughs> tongue. So in Crichton's world, if T. Rex has a forked tongue for some strange reason, and Velociraptor has it, then we would it would be reasonable to assume that it was at least a Silurosaurian thing. Right? Yeah. So we would then see it in perhaps the Compies, the Compsognathuses, mm -hmm. in uh, things like Troodon and, and Deinonychus, the other sort of raptor dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. The Gallimimuses mm -hmm. That's right. are mm -hmm. part of that group. The Dilophosaur? Uh, now, oh, that being is said, Dilophosaur fit in there? Uh, uh, no, Dilophosaurus is a much it's too earlier early. branch of okay. theropods. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the other interesting note is that that Coelurosaur group also includes birds. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So... If it were, if a forked tongue were for some reason a thing among those dinosaurs, mm -hmm. it would have to have then been lost in birds. Yes. But I think that it is probably very unlikely that T. rex or Velociraptor would have had a forked tongue. Okay. And if they did, it would be something that they had convergently right. with snakes, that they had evolved oh, yes. on their own that was they not, are not anywhere the same near origin related to snakes no. so, uh, as reptiles go. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's it, it's not like it's not something that it is typically considered for dinosaurs. Well, and I remember I, 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 this is a vague recollection, but of a behind the scenes yeah. thing. Will's pointing at me because he remembers this too. <laughs> that part of the behind the scenes feature in Jurassic Park the movie was an anecdote about an early animation of the Velociraptor that had them flicking the tongue in and out. Oh, that's right. That's that right. was going to be claymation. Yes, exactly. Which science advisor. Jack Horner apparently uh, made us think about and said, don't do that. Yeah. That is not how we are depicting these animals. That's not likely to be how mm -hmm. they would have acted. Okay. Yeah, that's the old movie way of showing these animals. Yes, as big lizards, whereas yes. uh, we now know, as we were just discussing, they are almost certainly going to, they're going to have a lot more in common with birds and crocs than yep. with snakes and lizards. All right. Yeah, that's excellent. Well, maybe the T-Rex just bit his tongue and that's why it was split in two. Um, yeah, that could be. <laughs> some sharp. Yes. <laughs> so, in one of the earliest chapters, on that lawyer. 
<laughs> he cut it dead. In one of the earliest chapters, we have a character named Mike Bowman, and you'll recall that he and his family visit an isolated beach on the Cabo Blanco Wildlife Preserve, and his wife is worried about snakes. And Mike hasn't any patience for his wife, and he tells her, forget about the snakes. They don't go on the sand. They're cold-blooded. And hot sand will kill them. Believe me, there are no snakes. How true does that hold up? Because I have a running theory that at any time a character in a Crichton novel says, trust me, believe me, or I know about something, they're usually ending an argument and they are wrong. <laughs> Whether yeah, they know right. it or not. So, and snakes on the sand. <laughs> right. I, I think it's probably a good general rule that anytime somebody in a fiction story makes a declarative statement about snake behavior, yeah. uh, there's a good chance they're wrong. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, snakes love the hot sand. Oh, yes. Uh, that's where they warm up. That's mm -hmm. where... Uh, uh, now, obviously, there are... That's going to vary by species. There are certain species that would not go out onto the hot sand. But hot, a nice uh, hot patch of sand, or especially, like, oh, a nice bare rock sitting amongst the sand would be a great place for a snake to uh, soak in the sun and get warmed up nice and quickly. Well, I mean, like, there are beach snakes. There are snakes that, oh, yeah. that make... Uh, uh, spend... A, a notable amount of their time <laughs> on the beach like that's where they hunt and that's where they are specialized and then of course now this isn't the case in where they're discussing i don't think but there are also desert snakes yep. that are specialists in navigating desert sands so that guy very well might have just been lying to his wife to get her to stop worrying about snakes yes i, I think now, it, what he yeah. should have said mm -hmm. what would have been a more accurate thing to say is you don't have to worry about the snakes as long as you're watching where you're stepping uh, the, the snakes aren't likely to be dangerous to you mm -hmm. because if a snake is out there resting on the sand it doesn't want to get into a fight it wants to relax and it wants to warm up mm -hmm. and it would much rather not be noticed by you than just try to pick a fight with you snakes don't want to bite no a, a snake a snake would much rather that you walk past it without ever seeing it and which indeed most of most human encounters with snakes go exactly like that that you you have no idea that you just walked past a snake for sure so looking at the the paleontological record when you discover crocodiles and snakes in the rock are they in formations that are also going to be productive for finding dinosaurs yes they can be absolutely can be uh, okay. so snakes had the, the oldest definite snake fossils are from the jurassic period mm-hmm and then there were snakes all throughout the Cretaceous, all over the world. There were sea snakes, there were land snakes, uh, different groups than we have today, but there would absolutely have been things recognizable as snakes during at least the last half of the age of dinosaurs. Of course, snakes persisted after mm -hmm. most of the dinosaurs went extinct. Mm -hmm. And then crocodile cousins were around the entire time there were dinosaurs. Yes. There cro crocodilomorphs are at least as old as dinosaurs. Uh, but crocodilians are relatively recent. Yeah, they, they we see our uh, true, true like group that includes our modern crocs show up in the Cretaceous, in okay. late Cretaceous. But even before that, and with the, the cousins, there were still very croc-shaped. Like, you know, there's plenty of species that unless you know what to look for it when it was swimming around would have looked like just a weird species of mm -hmm. croc because it was still short-limbed long-faced <laughs> swimming and likely hunting on along the riverbank well and that even includes some of the famous quote crocs mm -hmm. so like sarcosuchus yes one of the famous giant crocs isn't a crocodilian nope uh it's not part of the same group as our mm -hmm. modern crocs it is an earlier cousin. Mm -hmm. And so uh, with croc fossils, that's often, like if you have croc fossils, it's often a good place that you could find dinosaurs because you're finding them in aquatic environments like mm -hmm. a river, mm -hmm. which river banks are a great place for anything to fossilize. Like uh, most things can fossilize well because you're s setting down sediment regularly. Yeah. Okay. And so it's a good fossilization environment mm -hmm. at, that crocs happen to live in. And right. Indeed, there are plenty of fossil formations where you get, uh, for example, theropod dinosaur teeth and croc teeth. Yes. 
in the same formation. There are formations that have dinosaurs and snakes. There is one famous example yes. uh, from <laughs> India, I want to say, of Sanajya, an extinct uh, type of snake. I think it's a Metsoyid, so something kind of like a Boid, but don't quote me on that one. <laughs> uh, that was just, that, that is fossilized inside a sauropod dinosaur nest. Yep. <laughs> so there are remains of, I believe there are some egg remains and at least one embryonic or newborn dinosaur fossil that this snake is, if if we want to be colorful about the orientation mm -hmm. of the fossils, the snake is kind of staring at it. Mm -hmm. So this snake is kind of fossilized within this dinosaur nest. So there was absolutely interaction between these groups. Okay, yeah. excellent. So in a, in a passive aggressive dinosaur question disguised as a snake question or a crocodile question, how important would you think that snakes or crocodiles were in terms of a healthy Mesozoic biosphere? How were they, like, were they important? Was it a healthy ecosystem if, if you're finding snakes and crocodiles? Yeah, no, I, 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 crocs, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, crocs today are keystone species in most of the environments you find them in, in mm -hmm. that they shape the environment around them and they fundamentally determine a lot of aspects about the food chain and a uh, food web of whatever environment they're in just because they're a big predator and they are they also produce lots of babies which feed lots of other animals mm -hmm. yeah. uh, if you have a big croc nearby in a region with dinosaurs it's also going to determine what other predators are doing what yes because it could be out competing other uh big predators it could be uh, the reason that the predatory dinosaurs don't hunt in the water. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> splitting so that they're not competing. Right. And these are staying on land and these are staying in the water. Yeah. It may be why we don't have a huge record of aquatic dinosaurs, that, which has been a big question about why do we not see swimming dinosaurs. Yeah. Like, we, we just don't find this evidence for... Uh, tons of species of dinosaurs that seem like they were adapted to the water. It's, oh, mm -hmm. crocs were doing very well during the Mesozoic. I guess so. Crocs are also a good indicator of ecosystem health because they are tied to both water and land. Yeah. So if something goes wrong in one of those realms, it's likely to impact your croc population. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so if they're, you know, if the water's polluted or right, something right. happens the crocs are going to be one of the first animals you notice uh, mm -hmm. responding to it. Okay. So do you think a an African savanna-styled wildlife preserve that Hammond was, you know, attempting to, to recreate, would, would he benefit from importing more snakes and crocodiles into his Jurassic Park to make a more sustainable <laughs> environment for, for, for the animals? Potentially. <laughs> it depends on... Yeah, it, it's... That's hard to... I'd encourage him to. Yes, I think that any wildlife preserve <laughs> is probably improved by the presence of crocodilians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and snakes. I'll give you... Yeah, I'll, I'll... And I'll, yeah that goes without saying. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's, it's one of those where in that preserve situation, uh, it would just vastly depend on what, what dinosaurs you were wanting to include. Mm -hmm. If you're wanting there to be kind of a, a balanced food chain ecosystem, yeah, which really... That goal of him being like, oh, we just want it to be a natural environment. Yeah. But, like, you're making the animals you're putting in there. And mm -hmm. so, like, if you include crocs, but then you also include tiny dinosaurs, <laughs> uh, you need to make sure you made enough of those tiny dinosaurs for them to outbreed being yeah. just eaten by the crocs. Mm -hmm. they are mm -hmm. the yeah, exactly. Like, we've had that issue with other conservation situations where, we've, like, there's been breeding programs for the red wolf, mm -hmm. and then they were released... And then those that were released weren't enough and were just eaten by alligators. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, no. Oh, no. Like, that's happened. <laughs> that's sad. That's happened. So, oh. like, you know, that that trying to make a natural... We don't create wildlife preserves. Mm -hmm. We encircle. Yeah, we right. put fences around it and say, this is doing... Let's keep it this way. Yes. Yeah. It's already <laughs> a wildlife habitat. And then we just make sure no one else goes in there. Right. Now, if you're uh, off the coast of Costa Rica, there is a very good chance there are already crocs there. Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, now, this was the... I don't remember how far off the coast these... 100 miles. Be. Yeah. 100, 100 miles. miles off the yeah. coast. You could, yeah, you could have crocs oh, out yeah. there. Oh, yeah. Okay, right on. So there probably are already crocs in Jurassic Park. Yes. Okay. Uh, that's exciting. Uh, and there are definitely snakes. Oh, yes. 
there there would absolutely do. You're in the tropics. That's a great place for crocs and snakes. One of the elements, I think there's a chapter called Equilibrium at the end of the book. And it's the idea that once the fences are down, the animals begin to intermingle. They start preying upon one another. And they say, wait a minute, there's fewer dinosaurs now. How come? He says, well, they're reaching a, a true Jurassic equilibrium is what they call it. Which I think, yeah. I think the, the number of raptors, tyrannosaurs, dilophosaurs, compared to like first like the the pred earlier in the book they described that like lions and and antelope have like a 20,000 to 1 ratio or something like that in like the wild there's something crazy like that in any case the those that ratio is not in the <laughs> on the island and so there's this is yes. the, that they are reaching an equilibrium is is folly that the carnivores were going to run roughshod over that whole island in a month is a, totally in, in you know doable and so this concept of equilibrium is is kind of I don't even know why they bring it up. But this whole idea that you cannot, you know, <laughs> build build a true preserve from scratch, that you need to encircle it instead, I think is one of Malcolm's great points in the book is that what you're trying to do here is impossible that you're trying to recreate yeah. something that is isn't going to balance out. And I think there was I think there was a comment like when they set out to do this, it was based on them literally only cloning 12 dinosaurs. And they built the containment <laughs> units, yeah. and they built everything based on this idea that we're going to have 12 dinosaurs. And maybe that worked. But then they went and blew that way out of the water <laughs> by a multiple of 10 or something like that. Like, they, they, had, over, they had almost 300 dinosaurs instead, and, uh, and that just was crazy. I think it's, it's funny that the character they employ to make this point in the book, and for that matter in the movie, kind of, is a mathematician. Yeah, a chaotician. Is a chaotician where it's like you could ask a conservationist or like mm -hmm. anyone who works with animals. <laughs> like Muldoon should have been able to tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> well, you didn't need a math guy to tell you this is the problem. I, I I appreciate that the point gets made because, and this has been shown throughout human history time and time again, that it is very easy to have an idea that you know when we first learn about like how an ecosystem works. It's like, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. You have to have big predators and medium predators. And then plant yeah, the, there's the checklist. Yeah. You just have to have these categories filled. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is that ecosystems that we still don't understand, like, like when you know, like fully yeah. understand all the ins, like, I don't, we don't understand an ecosystem like we do a car engine. We are still trying to figure out exactly where all the levels of interactions are exactly what the effects of certain things are you know there are chemical interactions in an ecosystem that are being discovered to this day where we realize oh evidently this mineral or this chemical is extremely important but we're not sure when the levels go down the ecosystem doesn't do well but we're not sure why mm -hmm. like, we don't know where that's messing up the chain of events ecosystems are so vastly complex that basically any time humans have just been like, all right, yeah, we'll just fix it. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't work. <laughs> well, it's, it's so often our approach to fixing is, well, we've, we've lost this predator, let's put in a new predator. Yes, it's a one-to-one -one <laughs> mentality. Right. Uh, that this, this, if we just separate this, let's just put a river in here. Mm -hmm. or we'll just put a lake in here. And those are so often major disturbances. Yes. Whereas these days, the mentality in conservation seems to be moving more in a direction of trying to understand what a stable ecosystem looks like. Yeah. Which is going to be different for where, where you are in the world and what kind of habitat it is, that it, it can come down to how much space is available for the ecosystem mm -hmm. or how many different types of plants there are might be more important than what specific types of plants there are. Whereas in another ecosystem, it might very well be that, yeah, this one species is gone and the entire ecosystem has changed. But you can't just put that species back because now there's no space for that species mm -hmm. and it's going to destroy what is the new equilibrium that is set up. Mm -hmm. It's very complex. And even with that, you know, kind of new, more modern view of things, if we were to try to create a, a preserve from scratch like they were trying to do ultimately you'd still have to go okay we've put all the pieces in now we just have to step back and see how it settles out yeah it's got to balance right, itself doesn't it yeah 
Yeah, yeah for sure. You, there, we cannot maintain it the way we want it to be. It would have been, you have to just see what balances out and then respond if you're like, oh, wow, it's just collapsing. <laughs> Jurassic Park would be hard to make. You're right. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's hard to make even if they were extinct animals. Yes, exactly. Yes, that's right. Even if you just wanted to do it today's animals, yes. it would be near impossible. Well, guys, we're, we're out of time. I wanted to talk to you more about your favorite characters and your favorite moments in the book. I wanted to talk more about egg taxa, if that was ever something we could talk about. Phylogenetic analysis and how that works. I wanted to ask you more about like chaos theory. I wanted to ask you about Bacher and Horner uh, in, in, in like mm -hmm. a Cope and Marsh perspective. And uh, and we just don't have time all the time. Would you ever think of coming back and doing this again? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We'd be, all those things would be tons of fun to talk about. Agreed. Okay. Uh, egg taxa. We can talk about paleontologists. Oh, okay. man. We can't talk about chaos theory. That's, no. That, not really. Not really. Because we, we can make stuff up. I mean, most of the stuff I, you wouldn't I, be the first. I have to say about the chaos theory I got from watching the movie. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> the only chaotician I know is a picture of <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming on. I really, really appreciate it. This has been amazing. All right, a big, big thanks to Dave and Will from the Common Descent Podcast. That was an incredible interview. I had such a good time listening to A, their podcast, and B, their answers, because uh, those guys are wonderful. The text this week is When Dinosaurs Ruled the Earth, spanning from pages 87 to 92. A synopsis. The group enters the visitor center, and Donald Gennaro presents the tasks set out for our consultants during their inspection of Hammond's Island. Malcolm's mathematical principles reveal that they needn't concern themselves with escaped dinosaurs. Hammond and Malcolm have a tiff just in advance of Tim and Lex arriving for the tour. Characters. Dr. Alan Grant. He may be our point of view character again, and he feels that the visitor center looks decidedly high tech on page 87, and he gives his perspective at the end as well when he sees the quote, two children coming down the hillside on page 92. His perspective bookends this chapter, but he's scarcely used beyond questioning why Malcolm believes that dinosaurs have escaped Hammond's Island on page 90. Ellie Sattler, uh, she and Nedry say nothing, actively do nothing, and Nedry's not even mentioned, but they are both on this tour, don't forget. Donald Gennaro speaks with Grant, Ellie, and Malcolm, who are the consultants, on page 88. Presumably, Nedry and Regis are just puttering around at this moment. Gennaro expects Hammond and his staff to, quote, show everything in the best light. So he wants the consultants to decide if the island is safe, and is it safe for visitors, and is it safely containing the dinosaurs. He culminates his focus on the island in his argument with Hammond that, quote, this is a serious investigation of Hammond's island because his investors are concerned that it's out of control. We think this is a very dangerous place. That's very, very close to a quote that Gennaro gives, I think, in the movie when they're taking a, a jeep ride to go see the Brachiosaurus. There are two pieces of evidence they have to deal with. First, the Procom Signatus specimen that was brought to Grant's attention yesterday. The second is that Costa Rica is reporting a high number of lizard bites terrorizing infants in their cribs and old people sleeping soundly. The bites are sporadically reported from Ismaloya and Punta Arenas. Gennaro is the reader's proxy when it comes to unpacking Malcolm's physics lessons, regularly saying things like, I don't understand, explain to me why, etc., and stuff like that, so that the professionals will reiterate important details. And this matches his character, eager to learn and understand before pulling the plug on Hammond's Park. He's doing his due diligence, listening carefully to the consultants, but recall, Gennaro has been charged with closing Hammond down at the slightest provocation. Daniel Ross, Gennaro's boss, says... Let's be very clear about one thing. I don't know how bad this situation actually is, Donald, but if there's a problem on that island, burn it to the ground. On page 58. Malcolm is saying that the park is a disaster waiting to happen and spelling out why his modeling forecasts catastrophe. And Grant should, at this point, be saying, I found a Procomsignathus from Hammond's Island and it's confirmed to have bitten the little girl in Costa Rica. But Grant doesn't do that. <laughs> that would be kind of persuasive that uh, they, they got a problem here. But Gennaro is an investment banker. And upon seeing the dinosaurs, he's, I guess, corrupted in believing that this is a potentially very profitable investment and his willingness to take risks increases. So forecasted catastrophic failure, proof that escaping animals are biting people, and the earlier reported worry that, quote, too many workers have died on page 49 aren't, quote, bad enough for Gennaro to shut Hammond down yet. And that's going to cost lives here. When Malcolm and Hammond have a bit of a shouting match, Gennaro, who is leading the discussion, tries to make peace by interrupting, saying, gentlemen, gentlemen, which plays on this trope that he's a lawyer aiming to control the argument and to argue each perspective in a more procedural debate. But Hammond has already stormed off, so I guess his interruption is moot. And then the grandkids arrive, at, and Gennaro is apoplectic. He's furious with Hammond on page 91. But literally speaking, it's too late. For some reason, 
they cannot ask for a helicopter to turn around. And so the kids are joining us here on Dinosaur Alcatraz. He says strongly that this is a terrible mistake. No, you get something clear. This is not a social outing. This is not a weekend excursion. But he's interrupted. Gennaro threatens to shut Hammond down if he has to and insists that the children are put back on the helicopter, but apparently helicopters cannot turn around and pick things up, so that becomes impossible. And when Hammond insists they end their argument because he doesn't want to upset the children, Gennaro concedes. He agrees, perhaps as a father himself, that distressing the kids is something he cares not to do on page 92. This isn't the lawyer in him. Any lawyer in him would argue his case, irrespective of the audience, until there's a verdict, which shows that again, even though Gennaro is commonly remembered as, quote, the lawyer, he's an investment banker and young father and demonstrably out of his league in terms of the challenging decision he's faced with making. John Hammond sits in the back of the visitor center with his hands folded across his chest. This is, sort of resembles a courtroom where Hammond listens to the plaintiff's claims. Our first, oh, balls! Curse comes from Hammond when his nemesis Malcolm says that animals have, quote, very likely gotten off the island. And this begins a tradition of Hammond cursing at his detractors, beginning on page 89 here, and says, oh, balls, all the, often enough. When Malcolm says the park is designed for the dinosaurs to never escape, Hammond snorts that they never have. And then they get into a disagreement and Hammond calls Malcolm an arrogant little snot before storming out of the room on page 91. Hammond reveals that he's brought his grandkids to the park where, quote, too many people are dying where dinosaurs are provenly escaping their enclosures, where my guest, Jamie Rayum, earlier rightly questioned, they're running a tour for the first time ever during a safety inspection, and he's sending his own grandkids out there to see if it works. Hammond is two things, epitomizing hubris. He's unquestioningly believing that he is in control, or else there's no way he'd do this. Second, he believes his park is safe. He's not hiding anything. He's not harboring any secret doubts. He's supremely confident that it is true. His park is safe. There is no doubt for Hammond. We must read it this way, or else Hammond is a sociopathic monster who cares nothing for the lives of his own grandchildren. And I don't think that's true. And when Gennaro is questioning Hammond's mental state, he draws himself up and insists that they, quote, get something clear, defending himself, exerting his dominance on this island. Hammond tells Gennaro, you're not going to shut me down. He insists he's going to prove to Gennaro that this island is safe. He'll demonstrate its safety. He says he invited the children because their parents are getting a divorce, and he wants them to have a fun weekend. Ian Malcolm. Malcolm solves the riddle of if the series of infant mortalities in Costa Rica that has spiked this year is related to escaped animals from Hammond's Island, suggesting that the graph is shaped in such a way that it shows a signature, that there are a series of complex factors creating the results, too many to be answered by a singular explanation, like escaped dinosaurs. Malcolm speaks in analogies to make his discussions on physics, namely turbulence and predictability, more accessible to the group, without prompting and without superiority, just with confidence. He's not gloating about being the smartest man in the room. He's being relatable, but not condescending to others, which makes him far more likable for us. Malcolm and Hammond get into a spat over the validity of Hammond's ambitions. Malcolm decorously tries to be civil when he tells Hammond, I beg your pardon, but you don't know what you're talking about, on page 91, but becomes the subject of one of Hammond's tirades. Hammond storms out of the room, and so Malcolm's summarization is only to the other consultants and to Gennaro. Quote, the point remains. What we call nature is in fact a complex system of a far greater subtlety than we are willing to accept. We make a simplified image of nature, and then we botch it up. I'm no environmentalist, but you have to understand what you don't understand. How many times must this point be made? How many times must we see the evidence? We build the Aswan Dam, and it and claim it is going to revitalize the country. Instead, we destroy the fertile Nile Delta, produces parasitic infestation, and wrecks the Egyptian economy. We build the... And then he's interrupted. We also get compies in this chapter. The strange lizards biting infants in Costa Rica are revealed to be, as Gennaro adds, biting old people who are sleeping soundly on page 88, which adds to their suite of prospective victims, anyone considered to be old. And who in this novel is old? This isn't necessarily foreshadowing, but it's a detail that helps build the continuity in the novel, which is a cool detail. Ed Regis. He's gone off to pick the grandkids up from the helicopter on page 92. Lex wears a Mets baseball cap, just like Ed Regis. They'd be twins. And Tim, he's a bespectacled boy at about 11 years old, we're told on page 92. And Lex is a few years younger than 11 years old, maybe 7 or 8, with blonde hair pushed up under a Mets baseball cap, a baseball glove on her shoulder. They're revealed to be Hammond's grandkids. Localities. We have the Visitor Center. The Visitor Center is two stories high, all glass with exposed black anodized girders and supports. 
It looks high-tech to Grant. Imagine a low-rise office space in Silicon Valley, perhaps. With all the mist, clouds, and humidity, all glass would be fogged up all the time. Inside the auditorium, a robot Tyrannosaurus Rex is poised menacingly by the entrance to an exhibit area labeled When Dinosaurs Ruled the Earth, on page 88, the name of our chapter. There are other exhibits, none are completed, with wires and cables all over the floor. And amidst these exhibits, there is a stage, so it would appear that the park would have shows of some sort, like a science center might, where guests can learn from an interactive chat here in the visitor center. It's spacious, and with a very few people in the room, Gennaro's voice echoes light slightly. He apparently can control the house lights from the stage, and I guess he runs a slideshow on the screen to present data to the consultants. Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park is described succinctly as, quote, an island in which genetically engineered dinosaurs have been allowed to move in a natural park-like setting, forming a tourist attraction. The attraction isn't open to the tourists yet, but it will be in a year. On page 88. Ismaloya, remember, is a fictitious village Crichton mentions on the west coast of Costa Rica in the first act of the novel, and they just flew over it en route to Isla Nublar. And the foot of the mountain returns again. Gennaro and Hammond uh, fight as the kids descend to the foot of the mountain from the helipad. Questions. The Costa Rican infant mortality irregularities. Gennaro presents a graph which shows that infant mortality is low in January and February, then spikes in March, is low in April, and then from May to July, it's high again. The data says low in between zero and two deaths, and the first nine weeks of 1989, there were only four deaths. Then there's a spike in March, where there's 11 deaths over the next seven weeks, then only one death over the next four weeks, and then the rate climbs higher, 14 deaths over the next five weeks, followed by a dip of four over the next three weeks, and then a peak of five more in the final week of July. The Public Health Service believes that, quote, something is affecting infant mortality that isn't being reported by the workers in the coastal village. We know that this is at least true in one instance, which we bore witness to with the midwife Elena Morales at the Bahia Nasco Clinic to, the, to end the chapter New York. Gennaro believes that the rise in the infant mortality rate may be connected to this strange new lizard, which he believes is likely an escaped animal from Hammond's Island. That's a lot to believe, but we know that in that one specific case, there is truth in it. However, Malcolm problematically explains that, yep, Per his calculations, animals have, quote, very likely gotten off the island on page 89, which we know to be true. But Malcolm says the results in the infant mortality graph are, quote, almost certainly unrelated to any animals that have escaped. As my guest Phil Hoare brought up in our conversation, wait, did we just have the whole first act of this novel telling us that a compie bit Tina Bowman and ate a baby's face off? Did we just go through all of that? We know that this is at least a little related, but Malcolm is confident that it is almost certainly unrelated. Malcolm indicates that the alternating peaks and valleys are a signature of many complex systems occurring at the same time. He says this on pages 89 and 90. No singular phenomenon creates a complex system. This is nonlinear dynamics at work, and he's the specialist on nonlinear dynamics. And so the kids are dying at higher rates in peaks and valleys for a variety of reasons, but not singularly escaped dinosaurs. If it were just escaped dinosaurs, the graph would bear linear results, a consistent behavior represented in the data. This nonlinear graph would require, quote, hundreds of escaped dinosaurs to cause it, we're told on page 90. The graph shows 38 deaths over seven months, with the increases beginning in March, so the baseline before the increase in March is that of about four deaths over eight weeks, or one death every other week. The diagram represents 30 weeks, which means that the baseline should be about 15 dead infants. And man, why can't the units of measure for this thing be apples and oranges? But it's dead babies. The total results over 30 weeks is 38 dead infants, or a little more than twice as many deaths above the baseline. And they fluctuate. To explain for the further additional 23 dead babies, Malcolm suggests that, quote, hundreds of dinosaurs would be required to cause it. That's kind of how it reads. But I think Malcolm means for there to be a nonlinear result in the data that it will require hundreds of dinosaurs irrespective of the values in that data. The shape of the data, or its pattern, or its signature, is nonlinear, which must be explained by too many variables, not just one variable. So Phil, let me know if that's a satisfactory answer to why this doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any more sense, but at least it's explaining why. It's the shape of the data that makes him say that this is nonlinear and therefore can't be a singular phenomenon like escaped dinosaurs. Uh, there's some allusions and references with the Aswan Dam and the Nile Delta. Malcolm introduces this concept that people are trying to control the environments 
like when Egypt installed the Aswan Dam and claim it's going to revitalize the country, but instead it destroys the fertile Nile Delta, produces parasitic infestation, and wrecks the Egyptian economy. This isn't especially well documented in what I have been able to find out about the Aswan Dam. The original dam was built in the early 1900s, but the Aswan was specifically upgraded or built as the high dam, and I guess between 1960 and 1970. So this is kind of contemporary in terms of something that uh, Crichton might be referencing in the 80s. There were some effects that are outlined. Uh, it says on Wikipedia that the high dam has resulted in protection from floods and droughts, an increase in agricultural production and employment, electricity production, and improved navigation that also benefits tourism. So that's good. That's kind of contrary to what, what Malcolm was arguing. It did result in Lake Nasser flooding, most of Lower Nubia, and 100,000 to 120,000 people were resettled in Sudan and Egypt as a result. So there is a concern that the that sedimentary de deposition was going to harm the fertility of soils. Soil salinity is also increased because the distance between the surface and the groundwater table was small enough to allow water to be pulled up by evaporation so that the relatively small concentrations of salt in the groundwater accumulated on the soil surface over the years. Uh, there is also health concerns... In any case, it looks like some of the arguments that are being made for for why the dam was bad or it had negative effects might have been explained away over time. Uh, perhaps there's been some political interference which makes these arguments. I don't know. But uh, Malcolm's arguments are not substantiated, at least, by what is claimed on the Wikipedia page. And I have not looked too much harder to find out why. Uh, we have other stylistic techniques like the rhetorical devices. How many times must the point be made? How many times must we see the evidence, says Malcolm on page 91. This is great because it provides a suggestion that there are many times that Malcolm's point has been made, and many times that we've seen the evidence, but he only has to give one example. Textually, it keeps the pacing quick, while sparing us from providing multiple examples that only serve to continue to make a singular point. In terms of making a persuasive argument, it, it it's insufficient. It It's literally mere rhetoric. There is a singular example, but we're persuaded to believe that the evidence is overwhelming. And perhaps it would have been had Malcolm not been cut off. And for the sake of pacing and interest, thank you to Gennaro for interrupting Malcolm, which is indicated with the M-dash. Malcolm is cut off from his rant as he enters into his second example of humanity's vain attempts at controlling nature with the We Build the M-dash. It sufficiently implies that there are many more examples to offer, but we're not going to do that. Again, a moment where Crichton has written Malcolm very well. Hammond defends his choice to Gennaro, saying, quote, get something clear on page 91, and there's an M-dash at the end. But he's interrupted, and the M-dash is used for a series of sentences that show that in their argument, they're cutting each other off. So that's good for pacing. Capitalization, the exhibit area is labeled in all capitals, when dinosaurs ruled the earth, like it's shouting in an email. And what is a dinosaur? And the Mesozoic world. These may all be capitalized to represent what the literal exhibits at the museum or science center might look like, with their labels all in capitals. There's a common tradition using all capitals in display titles, even though capitalization makes reading things much more difficult. And Crichton here is importing those texts into his text, which he'll do again in this chapter by providing a chart. Metatextual inclusions, similar to the reports that Hammond sent to Grant and Sattler, Crichton shows a graph in its entirety rather than having someone describe what the graph says or looks like on page 89. In this case, the Public Health Service in San Jose shows infant mortality in the towns of the west coast of Costa Rica from earlier in the year in 1998. Other things he uses include italics. You did what? You invited who? Are you out of your goddamn mind? What, who, and mind are all italicized, adding extra emphasis not only in how we're to read Gennaro's expressions, but it also draws terrific attention to three things that really raise the stakes in this chapter and story. What Hammond has done, the grandkids who have arrived, and his mental state. Remember, he's said to be under too much pressure. All are specifically noted here. And we know that Hammond's mental state has led to his actions, specifically in subjecting his guests into what we have been forewarned is already known to be the InGen incident, where all but a handful of people die in those last two days in August 1989 on a remote island off the west coast of Costa Rica. We're told in the introduction, or in the beginning. No, you get something clear, Gennaro fights back at any resistance from Hammond, but it's cut off again by Hammond. We have some analogies, uh, like water dripping from a tap. So if you turn on the faucet just a little, you get a constant drip, drip, drip. But if you open it a little more so that there's a bit of turbulence in the flow, then you get alternating large and small drops. Drip, 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 like that. Turbulence produces alternation. It's a signature. And you will get an alternating graph, like this, for the spread of any new illness in a community. Is increasing water flow actually increasing turbulence? 
What Malcolm is describing in this tap dripping analogy is a laminar flow, which occurs at low speeds with small diameters, low densities, and high viscosities. It's constant, whereas a turbulent flow, when the tap is open further, occurs at a higher speed with larger diameters, higher densities, and lower viscosities, according to some experiment found on Princeton's website. The park is just a zoo, referring back to our laminar flow, which occurs for low speeds, small diameters, low densities, and high viscosities. What the zoo analogy is suggesting is that that Jurassic Park is in control, metaphorically, making the speed and density low, the diameter small, and the viscosity high, or in other words, a predictable, a predictable laminar flow in physics terms. Malcolm is saying that this concept is impossible. With an entirely unknown extinct ecosystem, there's no way anyone who's in control of this park is able to either know what speed or density would even be considered low, let alone how to set that speed and density too low. They don't know what relative diameter would be considered small, let alone how to set that diameter properly. And they don't know to what end these brand new unknown animals might behave with a high viscosity, or in other words, how eager they might be to thrust out of the tap. The extinct ecosystem is, quote, far more ambitious than a zoo. It's more akin to making a space station on Earth. And in our terrific interview earlier today, we discussed quite a bit about how, how preserves just are very, very challenging. It's easier to encircle an ecosystem than it is to try and take a circle of area and then put an ecosystem into it. Space station on Earth on page 90 here. Something more akin to making a space station on Earth is an analogy used. It's a little obtuse, but I guess it'd be like considering a facility that's physically, like literally in terms of physics, completely, totally unfit for its environment from design to execution entirely. So a space station does not belong on Earth. It would not work. Or vice versa, putting an Earth station into space. I don't know. It's not a great analogy. I don't think it's very effective. It didn't pay off very well for me. Paying taxes. And so believing that the park has all the characteristics of a turbulent flow rather than a laminar flow, Malcolm says it's a certainty that it will react chaotically. It's rather like my asking you whether on a billion dollars in income you had to pay tax. You wouldn't need to take out a calculator to check. You'd know tax was owed. Similarly, I know overwhelmingly that one cannot successfully duplicate nature in this way or hope to isolate it. So no matter what the calculations are, Malcolm says, he knows that chaos will be the result. Discussion contrivances in the plot. When it's said that the helicopter has already left and the kids can't get back on it, that's obviously a contrivance of plot. Just like there being no lethal weapons on the island. It's ridiculous. But the story's conflict doesn't achieve its great heights without these contrivances. As readers, we accept the contrivances so we can enjoy the narrative. But even if the sounds of the rotors were fading away, let's say that they were a minute or even five minutes out, it's a 40-minute flight. Almost certainly the chopper could turn around and make a pickup at almost any point during that journey. No problem. Helicopters can slow down and turn around, like any other vehicle. And the pilot would. That's their job, to take off, fly, and land to and from the destinations that they're chartered to go. And making diversions for safety reasons is part of the job. Happens all the time, except this time because plot. But that's okay. We like Tim. And Lex, right? Chaos Theory. Malcolm gets... A chance to discuss chaos theory a little bit more in this chapter by interpreting a graph's shape and concluding that the factors affecting the data are too numerous to represent the sudden introduction of a singular variable. This is one of the elements of chaos theory that is most visible in Jurassic Park. The idea that too many variables hitting at once makes predictability unlikely. But as a system, overall, you can see that it's going to collapse. I guess this might be like a food web where in nature, if one link in the food chain is eliminated, the entire chain may collapse. Malcolm has identified a series of areas that he says are most likely to be the problem areas for Jurassic Park, which will lead to collapse. Containing the animals is one of them. So, he believes that dinosaurs have likely escaped. Why? Because Hammond is attempting to recreate a natural environment from the past, an isolated world where extinct creatures roam free, but Malcolm's belief is that this ambition is impossible. Which leads us to hubris. In this chapter, Malcolm speaks specifically demands hubris to control nature and how it's destined to fail. He says specifically that he's not biased by concerns for environmentalism. Quote, I'm no environmentalist, but, on page 91. And he refocuses his belief that complex systems like nature cannot be controlled or replicated. Attempts to do so lead to catastrophe, as example by the Aswan Dam. 
However well exampled or not, I don't know, but he means it to be a very good example, so good for him. Here's a big pillar moment in Creighton's trademark motif from his prestigious career. Man is not meant to control nature, and efforts to do so, especially through exploiting scientific application, will lead to horrifying consequences. Crichton tropes. Two more famous Crichton tropes also appear in, not only in this novel, but specifically in this chapter. And that's some kids show up in the story to help raise the stakes. And they're present because their parents are getting a divorce. Divorce and unhappy marriages and kids raising the stakes are equally prevalent in the Crichton novel as a man's hubris in controlling nature with technology. And that all three of these elements feature prominently in this chapter makes this one of the most crichton chapters in the whole book. Uh, we can talk a little bit more about Hammond's God Complex. Hammond's hubris, as outlined earlier to recap, shows that he unquestioningly believes he is in control, or else he wouldn't subject all these people to potentially fatal threats. He's not Jigsaw. This concept of control, where on this island he's carefully crafted a utopian place of wonder, can be an example of Hammond's God Complex. There are bits and pieces that suggest he sees himself as a god on this island, and this is just another moment we can use to argue for that. And perhaps this complex can be read as a mental illness. Gennaro must feel the same way we do, that Hammond is out of his goddamn mind. On page 91. This is my island, and I can invite whomever I want, he says, dominating the furious Gennaro. Due diligence, Gennaro was listening to his consultant consult on why Jurassic Park is dangerous when he hears a helicopter and believes it's the remains of the Procom Signathus sample flown in from New York, so he cuts off Malcolm and they head out. This is the final reference to the Compi remains. We know the Compi remains are coming in from New York, and we believe that this flight has arrived from New York, but instead of receiving the dinosaur remains, they get two kids. Maybe they also get the Compi remains. Perhaps the kids and remains carpooled from New York. In my head canon, I like to think that they did, but the Compi remains are literally never seen or heard from again. And, like Terminator 2 theory, when some bits of, are left behind somewhere in the world, Biosyn might be able to get their hands on them and clone dinosaurs anyhow. And instead, this works because the Compi remains are incinerated in the bombing of Isla Nublar at the end of this book. So I like to think that the remains and the kids arrive from New York together at the same time. And so this perhaps makes Hammond's ability to make a late call to sneak his grandkids onto a flight to Costa Rica a little more viable, in that the flight was already booked by Gennaro and the kids just had to hitch a ride. Unescorted, without a moment to pack, and presumably missing a day of school on Friday, but it's still viable. Nothing has contradicted that theory anyhow. And that's it. Incredible thank you to my wonderful guests, David and Will from the Common Descent podcast. All these, all these guests I get on here, they make the show so much better. I know that they're the highlight when people listen, so thank you, thank you to them. I want to sign off today thanking you for joining me. If you want to read along in the book, add some thoughts to what we've been discussing on the show, or be a guest on the show and chat with me about anything you like about Jurassic Park, you can do that by connecting with me. I'm at ryansrogers at gmail.com. If you'd like to be a guest, you can drop me a line and we can try and set something up. We can rehash and tear down and gush over and chit-chat about any part of the book or also not the book, all you'd like. Jurassic Park cast is part of the Spring Chickens banner of amateur intellectual properties, including the Spring Chickens funny pages, the Tomb of the Undead graphic novel, the Second Lapse graphic novelettes, the infantry, and the worst of them all, the King Street Games. You can find all that baggage in the show notes or by visiting the schickens.blogspot.com or finding us on Facebook at facebook.com slash springchickencapers. For me, I'm on Twitter at rogersryan22. Thank you dearly for tuning into the Jurassic Park cast, Jurassic Park podcast, where we talk about the novel Jurassic Park, and also not that too. Until next time. <laughs>